I will uh, guide you a bit through the financial flows and maybe some particular aspects of uh, the financial side of your projects. Um, with regard to maybe what you might be asking already, how am I going to get paid? How am I going to get uh, my money that I have uh, allocated in my uh, in the application form? And I first have to mention that expenditure, whatever you incur, has to be pre-financed by the institution. And only after that, you will be receiving the funds. Looking here at this organigram, I mean, you can see that first it starts from the European Commission, but I will go from bottom up because this is how the flow is actually um, meant from a reporting point of view. And then for uh, the receiving the funds for the payment, it goes from top to down, and then I will get to that too. So uh, each project partner has to... Uh, have um, Christoph has already mentioned the partner report. So when the six months are over, it is recommended to immediately start uh, filling in the list of expenditure in the partner report, which will then go to the national controllers. The national controllers are those bodies and and uh, companies that will be um, verifying the costs. Only if costs are actually verified by the national controllers can they be included in a, in a finance report. So then once the controller issues the certificate, it can then be included by the lead partner in a joint finance report. We have already um, mentioned earlier the, the differences between the joint finance report and the joint activity report. And uh, it was already mentioned that in our program nowadays, we have disentangled this. So the lead partner needs to prepare a joint finance report, which is practically um, the certificates of the of the partners. There is not much to be filled in. There are there is one or two uh, text boxes that need to be filled in. However, the main part of the joint finance report is actually the certificates from the controllers, where they verify the costs of each single partner. This joint finance report is sent to the joint secretariat, and we do our checks on the on the report. Uh, if Everything is clear. It goes directly from us to the managing authority for their checks. If not, we might come back to you for some clarifications, asking some things about how the control documents maybe were filled in or even uh, maybe what are the delays, what are um, issues that you have encountered from a financial perspective. But as I said, the minute uh, the, all the clarifications are are clarified, um, we proceed to the managing authority. So if the managing authority is satisfied, then we can see now how we're going to get paid. First of all, we get, of course, the ERDF amounts from the European Commission, who will then uh, transfer the amounts to the managing authority, and the managing authority transfers the ERDF amount to the lead partner. We have heard earlier that we follow the lead partner principle and therefore the managing authority transfers the amount to the lead partner and that is why it is very important that in the section on the additional information in, in, in GEMS that the account, the bank account details of the lead partner are correct. So please make sure that the amounts are, that the details are correct so that uh, you will be able to receive the ERDF amount of the full partnership, and then it is the obligation of the lead partner to distribute the ERDF amounts to the project partners. So this is how you will ultimately get reimbursed. We do not have any pre-financing from our end, and it is, as I mentioned before, each beneficiary has to first incur the costs and then get reimbursed from our end through this reporting that we have already um, presented today. Going to the next, the national control systems, I have already 
um, mentioned, the controllers. And in our program, we have two different type of systems, starting with centralized systems, uh, five out of our, um, sorry, six out of our nine member states follow centralized systems. These are the Czech Republic, Croatia, Hungary, Poland, Slovakia, and Slovenia. What does it mean? It may, basically means that the member state appoints one single body that performs the verification of the expenditure of all the beneficiaries that are located on its territory. Then we have the decentralized systems, which are followed by Austria, Germany, and Italy. I will, for the time being, park a bit Austria and say more about Germany and Italy, because in Austria has a bit of, a, I would say, a mixed system. It's not purely decentralized. What is purely decentralized is in Germany and Italy, where the beneficiaries are free to appoint their own controllers. Uh, this means that Following procurement procedures, the beneficiary selects a controller and then it is up to the uh, control body in the member state to approve such a controller. So if it is yes, the controller is approved by the approbation body and then what we call an approbation certificate is issued and then it can be uh, the selected controller can be assigned in GEMS or otherwise maybe um, the at national level, the control body says, no, this is not a good controller. It does not uh, qualify, so they can reject. And that is for Germany and, and Italy. However, for Austria, this is really restricted because it is not, uh, the Austrian partners cannot freely select their controller. When it comes to uh, the national control systems, it's important that you start making contact with your control bodies and um, any issues that you might have questions on eligibility, how to report certain things to them, uh, you can already start from the very beginning having this communication exchange with the controllers. It is quite vital that you do this. Um, yeah, this is mainly uh, the systems that we have in our program. And going to the next uh, slide, I wanted to present a bit the time-wise eligibility. And here, I think uh, I've seen some also questions in Slido where we might already uh, give you some answers already here when I am presenting this. So when we look at the project, we look at it in three phases. The first phase, which is the preparation and contracting phase. You have just gone through it. You have submitted an application form. It was um, approved. And then you had to um, revise slightly the application form based on the, um, the uh, conditions and, and improvements that were necessary. So this is the phase where we call the preparation and contracting phase. This is the first phase. And the reimbursement of this phase is through the lump sum. Also, the lump sum was already mentioned earlier, and I will also come to it in my presentation in, in, in the next slides. Then there is what we call the implementation phase. And here it is from the start date of the project until the end date of the project. And with regards to the costs, even the eligibility runs from the star date, how you have defined the star date now in this, um, in the preparation and contracting phase with your program officers, you have already defined when the project will start. And that is the starting date. You have the end date and implementation costs are eligible from start to end, whatever is incurred before the start date of the project is not eligible. So this is, um, yeah, the uh, implementation period, and I have already mentioned how you get reimbursed for this uh, implementation costs via the joint finance report and the certificates that are issued by the control. Then we have the last phase, the third phase, which is the closure phase. Um, 
When it comes to the reimbursement of this, one has to link it also with the implementation costs. <laughs> so everything that relates to implementation has to be incurred, so spent by the end of the project. However, then you might receive some invoices or some, some costs need to be paid a bit later than the end date of the project, you have a, what we call a grace period of 30 days for the payment of the last implementation costs. When it comes to the closure costs, these relate to the preparation and submission of the last, pro of the last reports. So, and here the costs are purely for preparing reports and submitting to the uh, JS. And that is the, let's say, end date for the um, eligibility of these costs. It is the submission of the reports to the JS. So this is in a nutshell the, the time-wise eligibility and why I mentioned Slido before, because I have seen a question actually related, should we start contracting, you know, should we start procurement at this stage? And the answer is yes, you can. It's actually also advice that you start um, preparing for your project implementation. However, do keep in mind that any costs that you would incur related to the preparation of the contract of the of the procurement procedure and maybe also of the contract are not eligible if they are incurred before the start date of the project. So this one has to to keep this in mind. Now going to the to the next topic, which is the preparation and contracting lump sum. We just uh, mentioned that this is the first phase of your project. And this is um, a lump sum that we pay only if it has been foreseen in the application form. And it's only paid to you, the ones that have been approved. So the projects that have been approved and have included this lump sum in the application form, then you will receive this. However, there are certain requirements that need to be fulfilled. One of them is the actually uh, the signing of the subsidy contract. So this is the first step that we also mentioned earlier in this presentation, uh, that the monitoring plan is finalized. Also, Christoph mentioned that it's a basis for the payments and that all the information uh, required in our monitoring system in GEMS is available. So, for example, the contact details of the management team, information on the partnership agreement, bank details, location of documents, et cetera, et cetera. So once these requirements are fulfilled, then the joint secretariat will uh, send the payment request to the managing authority which would amount to an ERDF of 14,000 because the total amount of the lump sum is uh, 17,500 and 80% of that is the 14,000. And this is the ERDF amount that then the managing authority will transfer to the bank account of the lead partner. And then of course, it is the responsibility of the lead partner to transfer the share of the lump sum to the project partners in compliance with the application form. If in the application form it was decided that part goes to the lead partner and, and it's then also divided between the other partners, then the lead partner has the responsibility to, sh to, to shift, to transfer this amount to the other partners. Um, this phase, we have to also be careful. This is the lump sum. As I said, it's a lump sum given if foreseen in the application form. And uh, we have to keep in mind that if a beneficiary uh, applying for this lump sum also receives an amount, another lump sum or an amount from any public source for the same activities, this is not allowed because it would be double financing. So. If you are receiving the lump sum from the program for the preparation and contracting phase, then you cannot receive another amount from any other source for the same activity, for preparing the application form basically and, and abiding by the contracting phase as well. So yeah, 
This is it about the preparation and contracting lump sum. And going to the procurement, uh, what is, I mean, when do we need to procure? Of course, it is when we have, when we need the acquisition of works, supplies and services. This is always subject to procurement rules. And uh, the rules are not always the same. Of course, they differ depending on the kind of good or service that you are uh, purchasing, the value of the purchased item or, or good or service, and also the status of the awarding institution. So first, we have to ask the question, is the beneficiary falling under the scope of public procurement laws? If it is yes, then we have to um, abide by EU, national and program rules related to procurement. It's always that it is the stricter rule that applies. Here, the hierarchy of rules is different from when uh, for, from the eligibility rules. In case of eligibility rules, it is first EU rules, then the program rules, and then the national rules. But for procurement, it is different. So first the EU rules, you have to check the directives on, on procurement, national rules on procurement, and then come the program rule. So if the beneficiary falls under the scope of public procurement rules, please look at these uh, different um, thresholds that, are, that apply and so on. If no, then for any procurement which is above the 10,000, uh, this is excluding VAT, you need to have evidence of an adequate market research. So this is needed for all um, services or goods that are above the 10,000 threshold. So this is the program rule. So if you do not fall under uh, public procurement laws, then the program rule has to apply from above 10,000. That is in a nutshell procurement. And now coming to the another topic related to financials is the audit tray. Uh, it's very, I mean, what is an audit trail after all? It is a chronological set of accounting documents that provide uh, documentary evidence of the sequence of steps that each beneficiary undertakes and also uh, the program bodies for uh, implementing uh, an approved project. So it's literally, if you, it's a trail, walking. What do we leave behind? First of all, we mentioned the subsidy contract that is part of the audit trail. We have an application form, we have a subsidy contract. And now we just spoke about, for example, procurement. So you start by, like it's taking a walk. What is my trail? First, if I'm doing procurement, I have to um, start preparing the, the specifications for the procurement, what the TORs. So that is something that you have to keep. Then you have the publication, pub publicizing it. Uh, you also have to keep track. Everything, all these documents need to be kept. And uh, another thing is the proper keeping of an accounting of accounting records and the supporting documents, which need to be held by the beneficiaries and also by the national controllers. So this is a very important role. It plays an important role in order to ensure that the audit trail is adequate. So just a reminder for you that setting up and maintaining an adequate project audit trail is a basic requirement for the eligibility of your expenditure that you would incur. Uh, also linked to the audit trail, if we go to the next slide, just uh, it's when is this essential? It is essential for each partner. So to set up arrangements, it's not only the lead partner, but each beneficiary has to make sure to set up arrangements uh, and to have a separate accounting system or an adequate accounting code, which you have to set in place specifically for the project. This is not a requirement from the program. This is a requirement from the regulations. And it is very important that at the start of the project, you have either a separate accounting 
system for the project or if you already have your accounting system and you want to just have everything in your accounting system, then you have to set up an adequate accounting code where it shows that the expenditure relates to the project. And also keep a physical or electronic archive, which allows all the storing data, all the records or the documents, all the audit trail that is needed. Uh, documentation needs to be kept. So when it comes to the retention of documents, all supporting documents must be kept at the premises of the beneficiary for at least five years. And when do these this five years start? It actually starts from the 31st December of the year in which the last payment is made by the managing authority to the lead partner. This is, you would say, oh, it's really in the future. Yes, it is, but you have to keep in mind that you have to keep these documents. And we will, at the end of the project, anyway, remind you and let you know until when you need to keep the documents. These five years, these five years do not apply in the case of uh, state aid uh, for projects that have, are um, state aid relevant. All documents would have to be kept in that case for at least 10 years from the date of granting the last aid. Again, even here, all those beneficiaries and all those projects which are affected by this will be guided at the end of the project until when they need to keep the audit trail up and running.